Uh, this weekend, we begin a little two-part series we're calling Sink or Swim. We've got these two water-centric miracles that Jesus does that Matthew puts back to back. And they give us this great window into what it looks like to follow Jesus. One commentator refers to them as the chaos miracles, where Jesus steps into these crazy situations and does something miraculous. Shows how he can step into the chaos and the turmoil in our lives and still it. And now, sometimes you just need an expert, right? No one can be all capable at everything. There are times when you got to call on somebody that can do something that you can't. Uh, for me, I often get to be that person uh, when it comes to technology for other people. That uh, when I was on staff at the uh, church in DC, part of my portfolio was IT services for the staff and the coffee house that we ran and all those sorts of things. And so people would come to me and just be like, I don't know what's happening, fix this. <laughs> and I would do that. And so they would not even know where to start, but I'd be able to come in and like, boom, 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 a couple minutes, we're done here. We did finally get people to at least try turning it off and on again before they would come to us. <laughs> Finally, uh, there's this great British uh, TV show where, called the IT Crowd where they you know, are IT guys at this company and they set up their phone to just answer, hello IT, have you tried turning it off and on again and then hanging up on the person. And we were like, we gotta get one of those. Cause, and so it was so funny because we'd have people that would come into the office and be like, hey, J hold on. And then they'd leave, and you're like, what was that? And then they'd come back and be like, I turned it off and on again, and it worked. Never mind. And we're like, all right, great. Uh, now, on the other side of things, if something goes wrong with, say, like the electrical in our house, I'm completely helpless there. Like, I have no idea what to do with any of that. I have no experience with it, can't really help myself there at all. Everything you plug into the outlet, I can just master. But the outlet itself, that's where it's just a black box to me. Completely. See, sometimes you need someone who can do what you cannot. One of the purposes of these miracles in Matthew's Gospel is to show us that about Jesus, in a way. That he's sort of this expert, so to speak, on an ultimate level. That he actually is all-sufficient, and we can go to him and rely on him. But before we see this miracle, before we get this demonstration of Jesus' power, we see him making some hard demands. Now, VIPs can make demands. You hear this all the time, right, about celebrities and rock stars and things like that? That there's these lists you can find online of like the 11 craziest items on you know, musicians' riders or whatever. Rider is the list of requirements that they give the venue. Like, for instance, Celine Dion requests that her green room be precisely 23 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's 73.4 Fahrenheit. I don't know if she's bringing a thermometer in to check that or what's happening. Uh, David Hasselhoff once requested a life-size cardboard cutout of himself. Because why not? <laughs> uh, Van Halen's rider has become legendary. They had a very strange request on its face to a lot of people. They requested a bowl of M&Ms in the middle of the green room with all of the brown M&Ms removed. Now, now, that sounds really crazy, but it actually serves a really interesting purpose. There's an interesting story there. Because what it was, was their sound rig used a ton of power and could be very hazardous if you did not set it up exactly to spec. Like, if you didn't do what they needed you to do, they were, like, risking their lives getting on stage because there was so much happening with their stage show. And so the solution was the M&Ms. Because then they could just walk right into the green room, look at the M&Ms, and know whether or not the venue read the rider. If there are brown M&Ms, they probably don't want to get on that stage. And I'm sure the crew wasn't too sad about having to take care of the brown ones for them. Like, ooh, brown ones, brown ones. <laughs> Maybe a red or a yellow snuck in there, too. I don't know. Uh, it's pretty genius, actually. Uh, and it's interesting because the bigger the star, the more willing that people are to bend to the request. These A-list celebrities can get away with some really wacky things. Prince was famous for requiring a doctor to be 
in the venue to give him B12 injections. I guess that's his favorite vitamin or something. I don't know <laughs> what that was. That one was important. But here's the thing is that if you're not Prince, if you're like some garage band, you might be lucky to get a bottle of Flintstone chewables in the back, right? <laughs> You've got to be important enough to make big demands of people. Otherwise, no one's going to think you're worth it. I once worked with uh, artists uh, at concerts for a retailer, and for one show, I almost crashed my car missing an exit to uh, go get water for the Baja men. So, you know, the who let the dogs out guys? Yeah, those guys. Uh, for the record, would not have been worth it at all. Uh, they're, they're, they're fine fellows, but... But we have this with people in our lives, too, right? That there's people in your life that you're willing to go well out of your way for, that you would do almost anything for. There's a very small group of people that I would drop all, virtually anything to go help. Then there's a slightly larger group that I would go well out of my way for. And as that circle expands, we become less and less willing to be inconvenienced, right? The less resentful we are of the request even. Like, for instance, Adrian can ask me to do basically anything, and I'm not going to be upset at her for asking. I'm not going to be offended that she did. The bigger a priority someone is, the further out of our way we'll go for them, whether that's a venue that's relying on some weirdo to make them money, or if that's people in our lives that mean a lot to us and are a high priority. And I say this all is because what we're going to see here is that Jesus is the priority. That's the message here in Matthew. And because he's ultimately important, he can make ultimate demands. He's supremely valuable, and so we should be more willing to jump to whatever he asks of us. So we're going to look at three scenes here. The first two are going to show these demands that Jesus makes. The second is going to demonstrate his power and what makes him so important. And so in order here, we're going to hit the scribe, the sun, and the storm. First, the scribe, and verse 18. It says, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus gets approached by the scribe, this teacher, right? And it's interesting that he's a teacher because it seems like that's what draws him to Jesus. Jesus excels in his area of expertise, and so he's pulled in by this guy. Maybe he sees this as a networking opportunity. And so he thinks he can learn from Jesus and improve his teaching. Maybe he can follow Jesus and get some clout for himself in this way. And the way he addresses Jesus is very interesting here. He calls him teacher. Which, it's important to note that in Matthew's Gospel, the only people that call Jesus teacher are people who are not and do not end up being disciples. Everyone else calls him Lord. If they follow Jesus in Matthew, they call him Lord. Everyone else calls him teacher. So there's no accident what Matthew's doing here. And make no mistake about it, Jesus is not just a great teacher. That's a perspective that still lives on Today, people want to respect Jesus as teacher, but they don't want to take the extra step and make him Lord. Jesus doesn't give you that. Secondly, this guy makes this bold statement that he's going to, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. He just announces it. That's not really the way it worked back then. You couldn't just go to a rabbi and say, hey, I'm going to follow you now. You had to be asked, or you had to at least ask them if you could follow them. But this guy just goes up, and announces it. And there's sort of overtones here of like, Jesus, I got good news for you. Today is your lucky day. I'm going to follow you. Jesus is like, pump the brakes, champ, all right? This guy thinks he's doing Jesus a favor by just showing up here. He's really thinking that he's the one that's important, not Jesus. And so Jesus gives him this response that just sort of shuts him down. Like, you want to follow me wherever I go? How about nowhere? Because I'm homeless, buddy. What do you, say? What do you got to do with that? This guy hasn't really considered what this is going to cost him. Jesus isn't building this platform to launch a successful career. There's no financial gain here. Jesus is like, I have less than the animals have. Are you willing to follow me there? See, discipleship has a cost. It's going to cost you to follow Jesus. I think our culture wants to be puffed up and pampered, and Jesus doesn't really do that. 
He comforts us in our affliction, but he doesn't keep us in a safe little bubble, right? It may cost you things to follow Jesus. It may cost you relationships. It may cost your career. It may cost your comfort. Following Jesus may cost you. Jesus points out here, like, I've got nothing. I don't even have a home. There's a reason, like, 9,000, why that prosperity gospel stuff is just complete hogwash, right? And so this is the point here, is that there is no reward without trial. There are no crowns without crosses. This guy wanted the benefits of following Jesus, but he didn't want to pay the price. He hadn't considered the cost. And so Jesus calls him to consider the cost. That's the scribe. The next two verses, we meet the son. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, this guy is apparently a disciple of some sort, right? That's what Matthew calls him here. He says another one of the disciples. Now, that doesn't mean he's one of the twelve. That's not what that's talking about. But he'd already been following Jesus to some degree. So it's interesting then that Jesus is calling him again to follow him. Like this guy's already on board, but Jesus is saying again, follow me. Jesus continues to call his disciples. The self-denial in deciding to follow Jesus is not an event. It's a habit. It's a routine. Aaron Rodgers didn't decide to become an all-pro quarterback once. And then he got there and was like, all right, we're done here. No, every offseason, he's got to get back in the gym. He's got to keep working to maintain what he's gained. If we want to be followers of Jesus... It's a daily picking up our cross and following him. And what this guy then tells him is that he wants to go home first and bury his father. And I think first is the important word here. His number one priority is his father, not Jesus. Now, it's not just his father, right? It's the burial of his father. And the Jews took the burial of a father incredibly seriously. Uh, They took every burial seriously, but a father especially so. Priests were not allowed to touch dead bodies, but when their father passed away, there was an exception made that they could participate in the burial, in the funeral, because that's how important that was to them. That was the sole exception. And so that makes Jesus' response here sound incredible incredibly harsh, right? Like, what could be a more legitimate request than what this guy is asking? Isn't Jesus being a little heartless here? And this is exactly why cultural context is so important. People sometimes ask why I use resources other than the Bible as I'm putting these messages together. Like, the message always comes from the text, from the Bible. But I use language tools, historical references, commentaries, other scholarly work to put together to study. And the reason is this, is that I am not a first century Jew living in Israel that is reading this in the language that Matthew wrote it. So because of that, I'm looking at it with my 21st century American glasses. I'm going to miss some things if I don't know about what things were like back then. This is why a great Bible dictionary is something I recommend everybody get. If you're looking to study the Bible, just you start with just a Bible dictionary. And it's an awesome place to begin a library to help you study further. And so this is what we're missing, is the burials in that day, they took place on the day of the death. There's a couple reasons for this. For one, they felt it dishonored the body to leave them out any longer than that. For another, the Jews didn't practice any sort of embalming. Mostly because the Egyptians invented embalming and they just rejected everything the the Egyptians did just out of spite. But what this means is that you've got these bodies that are not embalmed that are in this hot, arid climate. They would decompose quick. Remember when Jesus goes and raises Lazarus from the dead? And he tells him to roll back the stone. Martha stops him. It's like, he's been in there four days. He's going to be right. (laughs) 
because that's, the, that's what happens in this climate to dead bodies that you do not embalm. So even hang corpses are buried before nightfall. You're a criminal. You get executed. They still are going to make sure that you get buried before night comes. They still respect the body, even in this instance, and they didn't want it to decompose too much. You see this with Jesus, right? He's buried the same night that he dies. And so that sheds some light on what this guy is asking Jesus then, doesn't it? Because look, his father's not dead. If his father was dead, he's not having this conversation with Jesus. He's busy doing funeral stuff. And so the fact that he's here talking to Jesus at all shows that his dad's at least still kicking So if his dad's alive, what is this guy waiting for? Maybe he's worried his father's not going to approve if he follows Jesus. Maybe he's worried, well, what if he dies soon and I'm not here for it? What he's doing is he's putting off following Jesus until someday. Someday when this thing happens, then I'm going to follow you. But until then, I'm going to do this other thing. And so Jesus' response makes a whole lot more sense now. This is why he pushes back at this guy. He tells him, let the dead bury their own dead. He's talking about the spiritually dead burying the physically dead. It's Jesus' view of the world apart from him. It's just the walking dead out there. Don't worry about that. You follow me now. Jesus doesn't want anything taking first place over him. Sometimes he asks incredibly different things. Here he says, choose me over family. His claims are absolute and they're immediate. He wants everything and he wants it now. And so I guess the question then for us is what someday are you waiting for? Like, oh, I'm going to get my life together and then I'll give myself to Jesus fully. After this or that happens, then I'll really get serious about it. Well, after we get married, then we'll get serious about getting to church. Like, what are you waiting for? Jesus is like, no, do this first. Do this now. Son, the scribe, and then the storm. We're going to see here a story where Jesus, this is why he's able to make the demands he makes. Verse 23. And when he got into the boat, so he's already established, like, hey, we're going to go to the other side. These two encounters happened. Then they get in the boat. The disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even winds and seas obey him? Now, chiefly, this is a story about who Jesus is more than what he can do for us. And we learned some interesting things about him. Here, for one, we find him sleeping. Even though the storm happens, he's at rest. Because he's tired. Like that in and of itself is just noteworthy. Because all throughout the Old Testament, before Jesus shows up, God's never tired. He's never exhausted. Here, man, Jesus is out. He's worn out from a long day of doing ministry. He's so tired, he's able to sleep through this storm, right? And so what we get here is this beautiful picture of his full humanity and divinity working at the same time. He's so exhausted he needs to sleep, but at the same time he gets up and performs this miracle. And now what's interesting is Jesus could have prevented this storm. But sometimes he allows storms to come. And when those storms come, he uses them for his good purpose. And the storm that hits the boat is impressive. The word Matthew uses is seismos, which you may catch as being related to earthquakes, right? We call earthquakes seismic activity, a seismologist, someone who studies earthquakes. It's where this word comes from. This is quite the storm. Yet great next to that word on the sea. This is like, this is crazy. Thankfully, I've never been on the water for anything remotely like this. This is the boat is swamped with waves. It's this picture of Matthew's painting. The boat's completely covered by the waves. You don't see the boat anymore. You just see the waves. How does Jesus sleep through this? It's the question I want to know. 
Like, even in my best, I guess, worst days, like as a teenager, where you could, like, march a marching band through my bedroom, and I was still going to stay out. Like, I still don't think I would have slept through this, but Jesus does. He's out. And the disciples are in trouble here. The story shows us that disciples need saving, too, sometimes. It's interesting that the words they use, save and perish, Matthew sort of uses those as loaded words throughout the entirety of his gospel. So it's almost like he's doing a little double entendre here. And this incredible storm's rocking the boat. And they get out three words to Jesus Lord, save, we perish. Which the last one, that's one word there. And it's present tense. Like they're fully believing that they're in the process of dying at that moment. It's this cry of anguish. Now, what might be sort of a chin scratcher here is why does this get recorded in the Gospels at all? Like, if I'm the disciple, right? Maybe the story where Jesus calls us all a little faith, maybe we leave that one out. <laughs> Like, who's going to notice, right? They're not going to know. We're the ones that have the stories. Like, let's, 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 no, let's, we got stories where we did things right, didn't we? Like, you know. You'd think maybe they'd be a little bit worried about their reputation, but they don't see it that way at all. They never have trouble painting themselves in a negative light. Because it's always in the process of painting Jesus in a positive light. It's always about him. It's never about them. There's a lesson there. And there's so much to notice in Jesus' response to them here. He calls them little faith. It's one word, it's this like pejorative that it seems like he's invented. It's describing this faith that's in crisis. Now, it's not a disqualifying characteristic. Jesus doesn't dismiss them because of this, but it's clear he's not very happy about it. This doesn't please him. I don't think Jesus is criticizing fear itself here, but excessive fear. He thinks they're overreacting here. I mean, sure, they hit a storm, but they forgot who's in the boat. And so what's the worst that can happen? And how much more for us, knowing that Jesus has secured our eternity? This is why Paul can say things like, well, to live as Christ and die as gain. And it's not all harsh here. Because you think about it, we see here that even when our faith is weak or small, Jesus hears our cries. That, I don't know about you, is incredibly encouraging to me. I have more than a few of these moments myself, right? And they're never enough to drive him away from us. So Jesus hears their cries, he stands, and he rebukes the waves. It's an interesting choice of words. It's like he's mad at them and shouts them down. It's like the waves are misbehaving here. As if there's like this supernatural element to the storm. He doesn't just command it, he rebukes it. We see him do here what the Lord does throughout the Psalms in terms of controlling the winds and the waves. And when he does this, the waves don't just like gradually stop. It just, boom, goes calm completely. The kids are going crazy in the room. Mom walks in and flips on the light switch and everyone's just busted. Like, <laughs> the waves stop on a dime and the disciples are just left like, what is happening? They're astonished. Matthew writes, the men marveled saying, what sort of man is this? I think there's a little interesting wordplay there. The men, that, it's a weird, why does he call the disciples the men? Like, that never, this is the only time he says that. Like it's never just like, oh, the men, mar you'd think like the disciples, or he'd say they, something like that. But he specifically calls out, the men marveled, what sort of man is this? He's doing like this compare-contrast thing here. There's this little turn of phrase. That Matthew is showing that Jesus is no ordinary man. He's set apart. But we learn a little bit about faith in this story. Learn that the absence of faith, Jesus sees as cowardice. 
He wants fear to be replaced by trust in Him. When we're afraid, we just exchange that for trusting Him. And ultimately, that's what faith is. It's trusting Jesus. It's confidence in Him. Trusting that He is in control. And we can trust Him because we know that He's never far away. It's the overarching thing that Matthew shows. Right in the beginning, they'll call him Emmanuel, God with us. The last thing Jesus tells the disciples, surely I will be with you until the end of the age. This is Jesus that is always there, that is always present, that is always with us. And so we can trust him because he's always in the boat when we go through the storm. And so what we see in these three things here is one is that Jesus demands hard things. He wants us to follow him through whatever difficulty life drags us through. Whatever that looks like, just pick up our crosses daily and follow him. Every day make that decision. Every day make that commitment. He keeps calling his disciples to follow him. He wants us to put him first above everything else. He wants to be priority number one. He won't accept anything less. The thing is that he can demand this because he's worth it. That no one else can take his place. No one else can offer what he can. No one else can compare to how incredible he is that when we put our faith when we put our confidence in him he's with us no matter what we go through he's there that we can be completely reliant that he is in control that as psalm says that he does whatever he pleases his will is never thwarted that he has his hand on us and he is going to take anything that comes our way and turn it for our benefit. Use it for our good. And so because we have this Jesus that purchases our salvation on the cross, takes our place, takes our punishment, is above everything that we can recognize Him as that. Put our faith in Him. Come to Him. Trust Him. Rely on Him. Because we have Him, we don't ever have to be afraid when we go through the storm. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You that You have promised that You would be with us. And that You take even our faith when it is small, when it is weak, and You still hear our cries and come to our rescue. So I pray that You would help us to trust You, rely on You, that when things get stormy, that we wouldn't look at the size of the waves, but we would look at the size of our God. Who does whatever he wants, who is in complete control. And will take whatever comes our way and use it for our benefit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.